scripture this evening is taken from the book of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 1 to 6, and 16 to 21. Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them, for then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they may be praised by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly I tell you that they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Verses 16 through 21. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show others that that they are fasting. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your face and wash it and wash and wash your face, so that your fasting may be seen by others, but by your father who is in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Amen. 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 Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, to chapter 6, Verse 10, so we are ambassadors for Christ since God is making his appeal. Through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ. Be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As we work together with him, we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says, at an acceptable time, I have listened to you, and on a day of salvation, I have helped you. See now is the acceptable time. See now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way, through great endurance in afflictions and afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left in honor and dishonor, in ill repute in good repute, we are treated as impostors, and yet are true, as unknown, and yet are well known, as dying, and see we are alive, as punished, and yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, and yet possessing everything. the word of God tonight for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I had a friend not long ago survive a terrible house fire. It started in the kitchen in the middle of the night. A neighbor of his actually had been called into work by accident. Another co-worker had gotten sick. So he was coming home at a not really routine hour. 
And he saw the smoke coming from the corner of my friend's house. And he knocked on their door, woke them up, and saved their lives. As my friend describes it, it was only a matter of minutes before he watched as the fire pierced through the false ceilings in his house, starting at one end, going quickly to the other end in an arrow of heat. Their neighbor went back to his own home and grabbed blankets so that my friend and his wife and their dog could watch as their home burned to the ground. They realized as they stood outside that they weren't wearing any shoes and they were missing the keys to their car. So they did the only thing they could do. They sat on the hood with borrowed blankets and waited for the sirens to wail to save what was left of the parsonage. When I called my friend, I asked how he was doing and how much damage there was to the house. And he said, well, the firemen, they're calling it a total loss, but I can't call it that. Since this happened, I've been met with compassion and generosity I've never experienced before. This morning, he went on to say, a woman called and said that she had a rental property that was open and that we could live in it for free until the parsonage was rebuilt. Wow! That was my response. Wow! Isn't that lucky? An extra house. And he said, no, that's not lucky. That's grace. He saved some of the ashes from the fire and put them in his office which I thought was a little morbid. But I get it now, I think. Some of it, at least. Ash is that little bit of biological stuff that remains. The same stuff the universe is built on. A little bit of carbon, a little bit of metal left over. Ash is what's in the stars and in the trees. It's what's left over after the burning. It's us. We are dust. And to dust we shall return. That's what we say on Ash Wednesday. And it does sound morbid at first. To remember our humanity sounds like a pretty self-deprecating exercise. But we must remember, I think, as dust and as ashes, we are that which has survived loss and mistakes and cancer and divorce and eating disorders and PTSD and whatever else may come along. We are that which is left over, that which testifies to God's grace. After going through hell, we are still able to stand because the glory of God has given us strength. We are both profoundly incapable of saving ourselves, nothing but dirt after all, and yet beautifully gifted to be vessels of God's grace for others. Ash Wednesday draws our gaze toward this sort of reflection. We have been branded by the fire, yes, but we have also been marked and brought through the waters of baptism. We mark ourselves this evening with ashes in the same exact spot the waters of baptism were poured, not simply to remember our mortality, but to remember that our life is a love offering given to us by a God who wishes to see us multiply that gift. God's grace sustains us, and we are to give thanks for that gift with our living. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust, it's where we come from and where we go. But in between, the way we live should be a testament to the God who takes dust and makes it holy with a breath of life. Not one amen in the house for that. Amen. All right. Uh, now we're having church. You guys almost forgot, didn't you? I think this is the point Paul is making to the Corinthian church. He explains here in this excerpt that Nolan just read. 
that what it takes to live as a testament to God's goodness is to first accept grace. He says that in verse 21. Accept the grace of God, but do not accept it in vain. Saying, sort of, don't let the way that God loves you, don't let the way that God loves the world be hidden in your times of grief or in your hardship or in your joy or in your celebration. At all times, he says, be an ambassador of reconciliation by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, he goes on, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God. By those things, show the world that you may burn, but you will not perish. You will not disparage for long, and you will not disappear. You will remain because the power of Christ is the power of transformation. In the light of Christ's presence, everything gets turned upside down. Paul says, we are treated as imposters and yet we are true. As unknown and yet we are well known. As dying and see, we are alive. Under the grace of God, in the power of Christ, with the guidance of the Holy Spirit, we are sent into the world not to be saved from its realities, as my friend so painfully learned, but being equipped to meet its challenges with the forces of good, with righteousness in the right hand and in the left, with mercy, compassion, and humility, so that God may be seen in our weakness Tonight marks the beginning of Lent. Traditionally, a time we remember by examining our own mortality that we are not God. A time to admit to ourselves that we are imperfect and that we are going to die. But also a time we look to the cross, once a symbol of death, now transformed into a sign of new life. And we say to the world, we are resurrection people. Beloved by God who chooses to redeem the world. Who can take ashes and build a kingdom. As you are marked tonight, know that you are marked not for shame, not for sorrow, not to feel as if you are less than you are, but as a way of claiming and proclaiming what God can do with dust and ash. Amen. We're going to take some time to meditate tonight, to invite one another into a Lenten discipline.